The reason 64% of engineers aren't on board with consensus view regarding climate change is we need a little bit more than expert opinion to move us from the realm of academic inquiry to applicable fact. Right, I don't just sit there and listen to somebody who's an expert on homeopathy or telepathy to tell me how I should live my life. I don't sit there and implement the ideas or postulates of those who support something like telepathy without them having met proof of concept. Now, proof of concept is your demonstration that your idea works, and it consists of three major things that all engineers look for. The first is you need to be able to make a prediction, and it has to come true, and it has to be accurate, it has to be narrowly tailored. That prediction also has to have very specific criteria upon which, you know, if this is true, this is necessarily true, if we don't find this, it fails. If your hypothesis can't be invalidated for a certain period of time, that same period of time is required to validate it, and it is all future thinking. The second thing that you need is you need to have the ability to actually detect the change you're claiming is going to happen. Not just to discern it from natural background variation, but to also discern it from competing alternative hypotheses. Because in reality, in science, there is only one truth, and all the rest is bullshit. The third thing that you need is the magnitude of impact of your variable of interest, in this case, CO2. If you can't tell me how much of an effect CO2 has, how do you expect me to sit there and design or build or tell you the efficacy of a system related to governing around it? Climate science has been unable to meet these, these burdens of proof, this, this, this concept that they need to actually push forward. So as soon as you start talking about practical applications, be it regulatory reform or infrastructure, you are no longer in the scientific academic wheelhouse. You are in practical applications. You're in the engineer's territory, bitch. And don't be fooled by my psychedelic cat. There ain't no hippy-dippy bullshit allowed here. Personally, I like the university. They gave us money and facilities. We didn't have to produce anything. You've never been out of college. You don't know what it's like out there. I've worked in the private sector. They expect results. Situation. Now I'm going to discuss how we would look for a new law. In general, we look for a new law by the following process. First, we guess it. <laughs> Th then we com Well, don't laugh. That's the really true. Then we compute the consequences of the guess to see what, if this is right, if this law that we guessed is right, we see what it would imply, and then we compare those computation results to nature, or we say compared to experiment or experience, compare it directly with observation to see if it, if it works. When we compare our observations to our predictions, what we see is that they're crap. Now, critics of this graph will say, oh, it's due to cherry-pick start dates, and that's great, Except the problem is that the two trends are diverging. That means that the, the longer this continues, it doesn't matter if you fix the start date issue now. Over time, these two graphs will continue to diverge. The divergence between the two is so bad that when we compare the last 20 years of observations, what we find is we're 95% sure that they're wrong, that our predictions were wrong. So basically, we can't predict it. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. In that simple statement is the key to science. It doesn't make a difference how beautiful your guess is, it doesn't make a difference how smart you are who made the guess, or what his name is. If it disagrees with experiment, it's wrong. That's all there is to it. But what about all of that other unspecified, unquantified, circumstantial evidence which agrees with the idea of a warming planet? I must also point out to you that you cannot prove a vague theory wrong. If the guess that you make is poorly expressed and rather vague, and the method that you use for figuring out the consequences is rather a little vague, you're not sure, I mean, you say, I think everything's because it's all due to mulch and Muggles do this and that more or less, so I can sort of explain how this works. Then you see that that theory is good because it can't be proved wrong. <laughs> if the process of computing the consequences is indefinite, then with a little skill, any experimental result can be made to look like a, an expected consequence. You're well, if we can't predict it, then we can at least detect it, right?
right? The issue the is what air. is causing the warming. Is it natural variability or is it humans? Like Galileo, he said, no, the science. Are you the aware? Science, the science is clear. You are depending upon are you something that perhaps is God made. <laughs> I love this. Natural variation in a scientific context is nothing more than the uncontrolled variables in an experiment. It's the stuff that we either didn't know about or didn't bother to control. Now, I understand the senator's confusion because most of the time when scientists and engineers present the public with something, the actual difference that we're attempting to detect is relatively large compared to the natural variation in the background. Consider for a moment a diet ad. Whoa, check this out. 34, 47, 50, 105. We all lost weight on Nutrisystem. Now, most people fluctuate in weight plus or minus five pounds per year. So when you hear that somebody could lose 105 pounds, that's pretty significant. Climate change is almost the exact opposite. It would be like somebody came up to you and said, hey, buddy, I can help you lose a tenth of a pound over the next 40 years. Would you be all thumbs up? I wouldn't. And that's not even dealing with how many measurements they would have to take in order to accurately capture that. In the case of climate change, they don't advertise how many stations they have or what the natural variation is. I had to go look that stuff up myself and what I found is we don't have enough measurements to make those kinds of claims. And that would be before we sat there and found out whether we sampled appropriately, which again, when I looked it up, we don't. So they can't detect it. It is usually said when this is pointed out, how much love is and so on. Oh, you're dealing with psychological matters and things can't be defined so precisely. Yes, but then you can't claim to know anything about it. So we can't predict it and we can't detect it. What's the magnitude of impact of CO2? Do we at least know that? So the other areas I can co totally understand, right? You're talking about a, a shitty observational system, so we don't really have the data for it. Predictions are hard. It doesn't surprise me that they failed. It's a multivariate. But you come to this, and you just... Ugh, it makes me want to tear my hair out. The equilibrium sensitivity is between 1.5 and 4.5. That means that literally the upper end boundary is three times that of the lower end boundary. Let's go back to the weight example. Imagine that somebody said, oh yeah, I'm a doctor and I know your weight is somewhere between 100 and 300 pounds. What the fuck, asshole? What the fuck does that mean? How am I supposed to gauge anything if the potential range of values is between 1.5 and 4.5? And it gets better, right? There's this little note in that paragraph directing you to the bottom of the page, and it says, no best estimate is available because of a lack of agreement of values across assessed lines of evidence. That means that literally nothing that they've actually looked at has agreed with itself. How the fuck do you present this as a scientific theory? What the fuck is wrong with you? And if we go back one previous assessment report, it just gets no better. Literally, they have to actually revert in the most recent report to the oldest range that was available since 1979. That means in four fucking decades they haven't made an improvement. And oh yeah, guess what? This is all based off of climate sensitivities simulated by atmospheric models rather than a calculated or derived result from experimental data. Let's use another example. Imagine you walked up to your boss and you said, I worked between 20 and 60 hours last week. What would happen to you? Because I'm pretty sure I'd get fired. And I would fire anybody who did that to me. The bottom line is that we have one of two possibilities at this point. One is the effects of climate change are so small that despite 40 years of our best efforts, we can't fucking see it. Or number two, that for 40 years, climate science has been jacking off to itself in a giant circle jerk, and the effects of climate change are so large, but they are so inept that they can't fucking see it. Those are our two possibilities. It's insignificant, or it's huge, and people who are studying it are inept. Either way, somebody needs to get fired. For instance, I had a conversation about flying saucers some years ago with Lehman. Because <laughs> I'm scientific, I know all about flying saucers. So I said, I don't think there are flying saucers. So the other, my antagonist said, is it impossible? 
But there are flying saucers. Can you prove that it's impossible? I said, no, I can't prove it's impossible. It's just very unlikely. That, they say, you are very unscientific. If you can't prove it impossible, then why, how can you say it's likely that it's unlikely? Well, that's the way, that is scientific. It is scientific only to say what's more likely and less likely and not to be proving all the time possible and impossible. To define what I mean, I finally said to him, listen, I mean that from my knowledge of the world that I see around me, I think that it is much more likely that the reports of flying saucers are the result of the known irrational characteristics of terrestrial intelligence <laughs> rather than the unknown <laughs> rational efforts of extraterrestrial intelligence. <laughs> That is to say, it is much more likely that the concern over climate change is due to the known irrational bias of environmental scientists and activists than the unknown and as yet undemonstrated impacts of CO2 on the environment.